other work she does includes identifying actual forest condition connections, forest connections, land utilization by wildlife, and general biodiversity health of the remaining wilderness and mixed landscape areas of the island of Sri Lanka. She is currently working in the Central Highlands, focusing on fostering coexistence between humans and leopards. She has an honors degree in environmental studies and geography from McMaster University in the US and holds a master's of science in ecology degree from the University of Edinburgh. It is now my pleasure to invite um, Andre Watson to give her presentation. Andre, you Thank you. All right. Thank you, Dr. Malik. Thank you very much for asking me to be here. Good evening to everyone. Uh, I take it that we have people from all over the world. So uh, hello uh, to all of you. Um, I will just go straight into uh, what I was in, uh, asked to talk about here and invited to talk about. And really the question here is why the leopard? Um, the reason why I thought it would be good to have this as the opening uh, question and slide is that because often one does get asked that question, why the leopard? Um, and so the answer is that uh, is what I will try to go through today. Um, and usually what we say is the whole concept here is sheltering under a leopard's umbrella, the concept of an umbrella species, which I will just briefly bring up as we go through. And the fact that this is a, a one solution for landscape level conservation. So what does the leopard really mean to many of us? Um, obviously from my perspective, I will start off with uh, on an ecological side. Um, it is a wide ranging species. It is the top predator often in many of the systems that it is found. Um, it is an umbrella species, which means that it encompasses much more than its numbers indicate. So it shelters under its influence many other species. Um, and so therefore, you know, from an ecologic, uh, ecological perspective, this could be a landscape level solution for conservation. Historically in Sri Lanka, it uh, has been our only top terrestrial predator and it has evolved as such for 10,000 plus years. It has no integral competition, meaning that it has no other um, big cat or anything else of the same size as it uh, terrestrially to compete with it. Um, and this is the only place on earth really where it has evolved as such. And culturally, this is seen in many of our flags. On, I mean, of course we have the lion flag or our national flag, but if you do look at some of the old flag drawings, uh, some of the Western province flags, some of the provincial flags, you will see that uh, it's a figure of a, a marked cat, really, that's there, uh, sometimes often spotted. So interesting that if you look back in some of those things, even culturally, it's a spotted cat that one does see. Obviously, it's a very beautiful and elusive creature. Uh, and today, unlike earlier, where uh, often it was shot for its pelt, today it is shot differently. Uh, photography has become a huge thing here. Uh, not just for the leopard, but for many, many species. And of course, that leads into the whole tourism angle as well uh, and the economic side of that. But I will be looking today more at the ecological side of it, um, since the question of why the leopard here is more about a conservation perspective. So many of you may already know that the terms flagships have already briefly mentioned umbrella species, but a flagship, of course, as you know, is you know the center, of the at the head, the helm of a ship, the flag. Uh, it's often charismatic species that attract much attention, and therefore this can be then utilized to also conserve uh, much larger areas and many other species. I've already mentioned that uh, they are of wide-ranging species. Uh, they act as conservation proxies for not just wider biodiversity, but large landscapes as well. Uh, they balance things, as it were, in that sense. And often it is able to in many of our systems, um, which are the key members of the, the systems there within. 
and they fulfill all of these roles. Um, often, you know, many people talk about a leopard being a keystone species and so on, but one doesn't really know if it is a keystone species until it is removed. Again, many of you will know that the term keystone comes from an architectural term. It is the key stone at the top of an arch. And when that is removed, the entire arch could collapse. But ecologically, for us to actually know if a species is a keystone species, it means that that species has to be removed. Now, obviously, we don't really want that to happen. Um, and so we would not really even know that often in scenarios. But for example, on the island of Zanzibar, uh, the leopard is no more. Uh, and yet there isn't too much of an inclination about whether any systems are collapsing yet. But of course, this is a great possibility and hence why the keystone term is also often considered for these um, you know, wide ranging species. So obviously since the leopard is one of the big cats, um, I wanted to just talk a little bit about again, why the leopard and why not some of these other cats, for example. Obviously here in Sri Lanka, we only have the leopard, but talking from a um, global perspective, um, I want to just introduce why the leopard again for conservation. Uh, these are obviously the big cats, including the leopard, as most of you will know. Um, so a large study was conducted some years back now, looking to see of all the felid species, which would be, which comes up top of the ranking for it to be used as a proxy for conservation. As you can see here, many of the cats came up on the top six. Um, the leopard here ranking fifth to start with. But if you were to add to it the umbrella capability of it, what you find is that it actually ranks much, much higher. So of all the cat species, it's the leopard that has now been uh, accepted in a way as an umbrella species to be an ideal proxy for conservation. Now, if you look at this slightly differently, what you're looking at here, NCP's national conservation priority and national conservation likelihood. And this study looked across globally at nations to see um, how it would fare in this. So national conservation priority obviously means as a nation, uh, how much would you prioritize? And as a nation, what is the likelihood that this could actually be used as an ideal proxy? And Sri Lanka falls into this top right-hand corner, uh, meaning that it actually has a very high national conservation priority and a high national conservation likelihood where the leopard can be utilized as a proxy for conservation. And why is this? Globally, as well, as I will get into in the Sri Lanka context, it is one of the most adaptable of big cats. Most of us actually know this, but it is good to remind ourselves once again that globally it is found in a variety of habitats and across habitat types, down from the ocean all the way to the uh, top snowy mountains, from arid to dry to wet to mountain, all across. It's resident in 65 countries uh, across the continents, other than, of course, the New World. Um, and it, it is extremely adaptable, as most, most of us know. It lives in very close proximity to humans. This could be a good thing and this could be a bad thing. So it's kind of a double-edged sword where one needs to look at it carefully because we can't just say, oh, there's leopard there, so therefore it's an ideal area. We have to look at many other factors that uh, factor into this scenario. But as many of you will know, leopards do live in many you know, uh, cities, Johannesburg, Nairobi, Mumbai, very well-known populations right in the middle of Mumbai, uh, leopards in Sanjay Gandhi, close to Nairobi, close to Johannesburg. In Sri Lanka here in Kandy, we've had a study population where they're within the Kandy study limits. So um, its adaptability therefore allows us for, uh, for humans to actually take a look at different landscapes, not just, uh, you know, the traditional thought of, uh, old growth forest and uh, PO type forests, although that is something ideally we would like. I think we don't really have the luxury anymore for that. So it allows us to take a look at these mixed landscapes and mixed habitat types uh, for alternate conservation options. But still having this kind of 
adaptability and this kind of spread across globally, it has lost 70% of its global range um, recently. So this is again a, a realization uh, that because in many countries, the leopard kind of flies under the radar where there are lions and tigers and so on, uh, for a long time, they were not looked at specifically. Uh, and now as global uh, eyes are upon it, we are realizing that in fact, it has lost a large percentage of its uh, traditional range, of its historic range. Uh, its status currently is vulnerable internationally. So what you're seeing here right now the, is, is obviously a map of its range, uh, of the subspecies range. Um, the gray areas are its historic range. Uh, the green are where it's confirmed to be, and then so on and so forth, as you can see, possibly extinct, possibly present. So as you can see, it's lost a lot of range in Asia, especially Southeast Asia. You can see how fragmented and how pocketed uh, the leopard populations have become. Um, so this is something that, you know, even in Sri Lanka, we need to take into consideration uh, because as most of us know, it's very easy to lose uh, habitat overnight. In fact, you can lose, you know, hundreds of acres of uh, forest, be, be through direct human destruction and uh, felling and cutting or forest fires, or that's happening right now all over the world as we speak. Uh, or slumps and slides where we lose large forests and where things are getting pocketed due to our unplanned development. Now, again, I think uh, even for the naysayers, I think we can all agree that we are currently in a biodiversity crisis. Uh, all scientists, not all, I should say, but many will accept that this is the Anthropocene, meaning that uh, the human species, the impact that we have had on the globe is far greater than ever before, hence the Anthropocene. Um, and the fact that we really don't know how to value natural systems, although we try very much to put, uh, you know, dollars and cents to it, uh, that is only what we can actually assign to the known functionings. Um, we also know that species diversity, loss of species diversity is absolutely rapid, exponential, uh, yes, we've always had extinctions occur, but I think it's, as we all know, the rate of extinction that is what uh, uh, is tremendous. And of course, nothing really is concretely being done on large scales at all of these conferences and so much we are failing to uh, achieve some of those large targets. So what do we as uh, small nations, individuals, scientists, civilians, so on, What what is it that can be done? obviously, because, you know, we would like to look on the positive side and not just always uh, on the negative side about gloom and doom. Um, we need to know information in order to know how we are to go about uh, coming up with solutions. We need resources for this. Uh, but we don't have the luxury anymore, I said this earlier on too, of how even, even during the 60s, I mean, our predecessors and our field scientists um, you know, professors that we've worked with who worked even in the 40s, 50s, 60s, they had the luxury of being able to study full complements of systems, study species for, you know, three decades, for example, and then come up with possible answers. We don't have that luxury anymore. So actually, we need a quick fix. Uh, often that's not really what we want, but perhaps we do have to sometimes go with that and see where we uh, can actually put in solutions. Uh, so we need to prioritize sometimes and have selected answers and solutions. Now, why is our leopard here in Sri Lanka so special? How does that factor in? We talked a little bit more globally here. Uh, I always like to say this, that here in Sri Lanka, the leopard truly is the king of our jungles. It is the only cat, like I said, and it has evolved as such, on the, the only place on earth where this evolution has occurred. Um, so it holds obviously an even more of a special role in that sense uh, than many of the other leopard populations. But even here, like we saw globally, we're losing range. We only have uh, roughly around 850 adult leopards. Uh, this number, you know, people love to know about numbers, for, but for cryptic species like this, 
It's not easy to give exact numbers, uh, but we don't really need exact numbers. We need a range to know uh, where we stand right now. Where does this species stand? Uh, and just on an aside, for any species to be continue to be viable, we need about 500 in order for them to continue to be a viable uh, continuing species. So when you put that into perspective here on in Sri Lanka, where we have about 22 million homo sapiens, that's about one adult leopard for, uh, you know, 28, 29,000 people. Just putting that sort of in perspective to see um, how are we going to manage this? How are we going to look at this? Uh, locally too, the leopard is currently vulnerable. Uh, I know Dr. Malik, you introduced it as being endangered. It, it was earlier, currently it's had a review uh, and it's at vulnerable, but we hope to do a quicker review now uh, and see where it stands. Often these classifications have lag periods uh, and they're proxies sometimes too. They don't take into account habitat loss sometimes. So these things will keep changing. So here too in Sri Lanka, you can see that the leopard is widely distributed. It's found throughout all of our habitat types. Uh, and other than for, you know, the west of the Western province where it is uh, human dominated, we still have leopards uh, surviving, living, uh, residing within most quite a bit large area of the island and across all habitat types. Um, so therefore, it makes it an extremely useful umbrella species here in Sri Lanka as well on the island. Now, if you were to see, look at that map again, that I've just overlaid uh, some of our protected areas uh, on the range map of the leopard, the current range map of the leopard. And what you see is we've got the dark green being a uh, 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 tier one protected area, we call it, which is wildlife department protected area. We've got two, tier two or level two PAs, which is more forest department lands. And obviously they have different uh, levels of uh, protection here. Uh, but still, if you overlay that, you see that the leopard very much is ranging not only within these forested and protected areas, but it's ranging very much so outside of these areas too. So just to step back or step aside for a minute before I get into the whole landscape concept and give you a little glimpse into uh, the social structure of how leopards uh, live, and then that will help you sort of understand the larger picture. Uh, usually you have uh, females, who live adjacent to each other and their range, their home range will be as large or and as small as it needs to be in order for them to raise their young, in order for them to have enough prey, enough food and water and shelter uh, and not too large that they can't actually control and have. Uh, you have neighboring females, uh, Females will secede land to their daughters, but not to their sons. And so sons need to move out and find new ranges. So a male will encompass three to five female ranges. So they are the uh, more risky of the sort. I mean, not that different to many species, uh, including us humans, uh, matrilineal in a way, where often our daughters too will stay closer to home perhaps and sons will move out and find new territory. And then we have the young uns who have to move through, the transient, transients who have to move through, uh, who are even of the higher risk category and they have to move out and find uh, you know, areas for themselves uh, much further on even. Okay, so all of this therefore uh, makes the leopard uh, sort of an ideal proxy to take a look at how do we look at landscape level conservation? How do we select for habitat types in addition to our protected areas where a larger uh, range of species can benefit from that type of selection? So we've been doing this work for 20 plus years now and really what it's led us to is the fact that as many of us already know, we cannot look at things in isolation. We're a small island and landscape level is where we need to sort of look at. So thinking about that landscape level, then we've already seen how the leopard uh, sets itself up socially. Let's take a look at the ground reality here in Sri Lanka. 
Uh, you saw from the map earlier that we've got some protected areas. We've got a good system of protected areas. Uh, we've got villages in between. Uh, as most of you know, we are still 75% rural. We've got some towns in between, and we've got agriculture in between all of this. We're still uh, very much a heavily plantation dominant uh, system here, an economy. So what about the leopard? How does the leopard navigate this landscape? So say, for example, many of us still think of you know wildlife in protected areas, a leopard in a protected area. So okay, let's start with that. We've got leopards here, but, but as you just saw, they need some of them will need to move out. Obviously, the males need to move out. Females also may need to move out if there isn't enough for them to take land from their mothers. So they need to then figure out how to move across this landscape. And this is one of the best case scenarios that they could have, where in the middle of human habitation, in the middle of plantation landscapes, there are patches of forest that give them safe passage, as it were, and these little stepping stones, as it were, or pearls in a chain, uh, where they can move through to get to a larger forested area, be it protected or not. So by having these little patches, what it does is it allows for wildlife to uh, disperse without too much disruption, reduces the risk, and also helps them to not come in too much into contact with human habitation. Now, surrounding our protected area systems, we have what is loosely termed a buffer zone. Uh, this is a term that's you know, got a, it's a gray area. It's from a long time ago. Some legislation will say one mile, no build zone, for example. And what that buffer zone does is it effectively gives a buffer, a protection around what we call our protected area. So it allows for a, a larger uh, kilometer range, a larger area uh, of uh, habitat for wildlife to be within, making the effective space of that protected area secure. So these are some things we're looking at now as well, because as you, many of you will know, uh, one of the first things that also go are these buffer zones in, in, in a protected area system. So I just thought I would go through some examples of where we've been doing work and how does this all fit in? How does this work with leopards uh, fit into all of this? You know, why the leopard again, right? So we'll look um, quickly at uh, these study sites where we've been working over the course of these, you know, so 15 or so years that we've been working. So let's look at Wilpatu National Park. You know, uh, like I said, everybody thinks of either Yala or the as where leopards are. Yes, of course, it's refuges for them. Um, and uh, let's see what we found there, for example. Um, some others who've also done studies here have come up with similar scenarios. Um, what you're seeing here is a, a map of the park. We use remote cameras for, you know, cryptic species such as a leopard, very elusive. This is technology that's now widely used, much easier to use to gain data with. The little red spots you see there is an array of remote cameras. And what we are finding, or what we found, was this. We've got males that have home ranges like this. And we've got females that have home ranges as well. Okay? And different areas, as you see. It's a relatively good population here. You can see that's a young female with prey as wild prey, of course. But what you will see on the uh, on the map is that, and most of you will know this, you visit Wilpatu, which is why you all go into the Villus, is that that's also where most of the leopards are choosing to have their home ranges. Now, that means, uh, and I do want to say that, you know, obviously uh, the study area did look at other outer areas as well. But what this means is that the effective size of Wilpatu is compromised because wildlife are choosing to avoid the actual peripheral boundaries. And they are clustering themselves into the core area. 
Now, of course, that can mean a whole variety of scenarios here. We did see a high incident of injuries in leopards. This could be due to intraspecific competition with leopards. Remember, I mentioned at the very beginning that leopards don't have intraguild competition. They don't have external species competition here in Sri Lanka like that. But is this perhaps causing intraspecific competition, which is being created because of the fact that the buffer is so compromised? Ukraine? You know, they themselves are choosing to become, uh, to, to stay in the core areas, increasing their densities there than would otherwise be the case. So that brings us into that whole scenario of our buffers and looking at the importance of that around protected areas. Um, this is some work we're still doing in Sigiriya. It's long-term work. For many people, you think of Sigiriya as, you know, cultural triangle, um, the, the area where the Sigiriya lion rock is. But if you were to look around there, we realize there's, there's a lot of forest still remaining there, uh, monsoon evergreen forest. Um, and these are two areas that we looked at up in Pidurangala and further down near uh, a different area of regenerating chena, for example. If you look a little closer to that area, this is what you see. You see these slash and burn areas of chena. You see uh, sections of good forest still there. So we looked a little, if you look closer, you see here you've got excellent riparian forest there still. Um, all outside of protected areas, sometimes adjacent to, um, and all near, you know, chena type cultivation. And what did we find? We found that leopards were actually moving across this landscape up north there in the Pidurangala area. The same animal we have here down in the uh, southern, southeastern corner near Kandalama area, for example. So they are actually choosing this extremely risky, unprotected landscape. There is a little bit of protection in the Sigiriya sanctuary. Um, to move through. And they're residing here. We still monitor these leopards and we still have uh, have had them for many years now utilizing these, you know, patch forest areas um, that are giving them refuge here for them. And these, like I said, are unprotected, regenerating forests. It's not only leopards that are there. We've got all the other slew of cats as well that Sri Lanka has. And we've got a whole bunch of other biodiversity. I mean, a lot of the small species as well. Um, not just, you know, the big cats um, and so on, right? So that whole umbrella concept is still being addressed here in these areas. So let's move to Galoya now, where we've done some work and we will be continuing now again, hopefully. Um, many of you uh, earlier, long before, uh, you know, a, an older generation to me uh, would have thought, realized that at that time, I mean, I know my parents' generation, Galoya was the place to be, not uh, not Yala, you know. Yala was sort of like, why would you go there? It's not the best habitat. It was Galoya. And yes, still definitely holds, in my opinion, one of the best forest habitats going there. It has uh, a true savanna still there, the only place really in Sri Lanka that holds that extent of true savanna. Uh, this image shows, you know, the, the Eastern Highway that was built not that long ago, I guess now a little while ago, but still carpeted roadways going through this landscape, um, which again brings its whole slew of issues as well. Road kills and so on, fragmenting, you know, large swaths of forested land. So what we wanted to look at here is we wanted to look at inside a protected area just adjacent to a protected area, a sanctuary, as well as just a patch forest. So this is how the patch forest we're looking at looks like. Again, it's regenerating chena, like we saw in Sigiriya, a little bit more cut up. Um, and as you can see, that's a visual on the ground. Um, looking at it from a topical perspective, remember that, that visual of, you know, leopards and other wildlife having to move through this habitat, this is the patch right there that you can see. So these little, you know, pockets of forest over here, those are key in these kind of areas where wildlife and animals use to move through, which also gives a cohesive connection for this large escape that you see here. 
and allows for this kind of chain iron slash and burn to continue with having these connectivities for wildlife and other biodiversity to move through. And what did we find? Once again, it's not just the leopard, we found this whole slew of mammal species here, all of our cats, small mammals, you know, the whole suite of um, biodiversity here, and also the elephant in this particular area. So then we looked within the national park itself to see how is, um, you know, our largest terrestrial predator utilizing this particular landscape. Remember that Galloway has high monsoon forest, so it's more of an old growth forest as it were, as opposed to Wilpatu and Yala, which is much near secondary forest. How is this being utilized? Prey base is not as heavy, not as high. Um, these are the areas we looked at. Um, the little white dots you're seeing again is our remote cameras. And what we found here is these are all male rangers within our study area. Um, and what I wanted to highlight over here, sorry, I'll just go back, is these are three, four different areas. One is in the interior of Galoya, Mulegama, where nobody's allowed to go really. Um, one is where more visitation is allowed, Namaloya near the reservoir. One is down by uh, a sanctuary area where there's a lot more human habitation. Um, so we were looking at, you know, the different landscapes and the land use types to see how it worked. And what you saw here again is what we sort of expected, but it was interesting to see that the interior is where we had the highest um, number of resident leopards. Uh, but the key here was the fact that even the edges, uh, we were finding um, animals utilizing, even with cattle there and with people moving through. So they were still navigating this landscape and utilizing all the layers uh, of the habitat available to them. So then this brings us to our work in the Central Highlands, where uh, when we started work here, it was actually to assess uh, leopard and biodiversity in Peak Ridge conservation area, the Peak Ridge uh, forest area. But due to, in 2016, many leopard deaths that occurred, we ended up focusing our work uh, in this landscape, outside in the tea plantation landscape where all of this was occurring, where many of the deaths were occurring. And we realized, okay, well, obviously there's something else going on here. Now, for many of us, we think of the highlands and we think of tea. That's the plantation, that plantation species, you know, tea that dominates this landscape. And we always thought that we needed to look <coughs> above this plantation landscape, up to the ridges, up to the remnant forests um, and, um, but what we found was that actually it's amidst the tea as well. It's not just once again this, you know, forest habitat that wildlife is choosing. They are adapting, the leopard especially, and using this whole mosaic of habitats uh, to continue to survive. Uh, it's been, you know, obviously over 100 years that tea, coffee and, and then tea came in. And so they have learned to adapt and utilize this landscape for this long. I show this image even though it's not very clear because this is one of our resident females and if you see down here what you're seeing is the town of Maskelia. So it's not often that you get this kind of perspective which is actually the leopard's perspective of what how it views this landscape. And this is the uh, Maskelia reservoir over there. Okay, so once again, these uh, white dots are all of our remote cameras. Uh, we worked over the course, you know, we're still working there since 2016. We're trying to understand long-term trends and identify areas for uh, collaborative conservation, your corridors that we can, and additional refuges that we can uh, put aside perhaps collectively for wildlife, uh, utilizing the leopard and how it uses the landscape. So this is what we found. We found this is one particular male who has actually now died, uh, but we had him monitored for quite a long time. We know that he must have been about 10 or 11 years. We have another male actually right now that we've been monitoring for seven plus years. And this is him moving through the landscape. Now, it's not often that one gets to document this kind of stuff without having radio collars and only on remote cameras. So 
it's actually really lucky that we've been able to do this. Um, and this is all one animal moving through the entire landscape. And this is a very, very minimum home range for a male here. We know now that this animal actually moved further onto this range over here before he died. So he has a much larger range. But what's interesting is it's not just him in isolation here again. Like in Galoya, in the protected area, what we're seeing is there's multiple other males that are adjacent to him. Um, all using, you know, the edge of the forest, that this dark, forested area down here that you see to your left, uh, the southwest is uh, Peak Ridge uh, protected area. Um, and this is all tea country over here with the two reservoirs on either side, Mouser Calais and Castle. Now, the interesting thing here is that the males are kind of using the edges as well as some of the in-between areas to move through. What was more interesting and what actually has now led us to identifying our protection landscapes is the females. Because as I mentioned before, the females are the ones that are breeding and resident and choosing where to have you know, their core areas. So all of these triangles are the females that we have identified and continue to monitor through. And out of interest, you will see that they're either on the very edge of the, you know, the protected area or along the ridge line here that then connects Two, this is the Horton Plains area here and the peak side, uh, peak ridge on this side here, or, uh, you know, this not side of peak ridge, uh, the, sorry, not peak ridge, uh, the sanctuary itself. Um, so this is where the females are actually residing and breeding. So if we mapped out the remnant forested areas that you can see here marked out in white. Uh, there's gaps in between, yet you can also see how these are like little patch forest stepping stones, and it's a connection, it's a forest corridor. And so this is the Peak Ridge Forest Corridor that now has collaboratively been established with uh, many of the plantation companies and other partners as well, uh, in order to have an additional protection layer in this particular landscape. The yellow that you see here is another study that we did similarly and identified this connection over here. And this is now the Elbed the Ridge Corridor. So by utilizing how the leopard moves and resides, uh, one can actually come up with these kinds of landscape level uh, protected area solutions that can be not necessary within the uh, you know, national protected area grid, but an additional to that. And as you will see here, these are not just one-offs. These are living, breeding females. They've continued to breed here. These are resident populations. And there is prey here still. Uh, many people think, you know, they're just surviving on dogs or cattle and so on. Our scat analysis is showing that it's, you know, less than 10% that is of domestic. There is enough wild prey here. I won't go into that too much in detail, but obviously that's ongoing work that informs all of this too. Now, an interesting quick thing I wanted to mention here is what we found is temporal niche partition, which is basically time separation. And it shows how leopards themselves are choosing to avoid the human species in order to continue to survive there, to keep themselves <coughs> separate from humans, and thereby reducing the incidence uh, and the conflict that is potentially there for them. Now, when you compare this to a protected area such as Vilpatu, it's very interesting. These two are obviously nighttime, you know, data, and this is daytime here. And the blue line, as you can see, flat lines pretty much in this peak area. Whereas in Vilpatu, you have much more activity, and in Yala, obviously, a little bit more. So this is just showing you how leopards themselves, we talked about them being adaptable. They're behaviorally adapting too in different landscapes to ensure that they themselves are coexisting with the other species, humans in this case, on these landscapes that are in unprotected areas where there is huge human presence. And finally, to Yala, because that's where everybody thinks about, you know, when you think about Yala. But what I wanna show here and talk about very quickly is the buffer concept here. Uh, we, you know, everybody goes through those gates and yala and think, oh, right, this is where wildlife live. This is where, you know, we start looking for wildlife. 
Not so. There's a lot of areas here outside that's essential. We keep an eye on. This is Nimalava Sanctuary and the buffer zone of Block 1 uh, that we've been working in for some time now. Here's a closer view. Uh, you can see there's still lots of chena here. Very, very high risk area over here for wildlife to move between here and here, which is much nicer, you know, better forest, obviously. This is the ocean. And what are we finding? We're finding that we've got, you know, young animals, this is a female, for example, uh, that have been their natal rangers are in Yala, block one, but we found them outside. They have actually, this female has had to move out of here, uh, navigate this very risky landscape and come and um, settle in Nimalava area. So you can see that these are very vital uh, habitats. Uh, for these populations within our protected areas. Uh, so like I mentioned in Vilpattu, um, if our buffers are porous and cut up, then the effective size of a protected area is lessened. If we have these kinds of other uh, protections, even if they're of a lesser level of protection, it gives that additional area for uh, animals to move through and move out of and settle. Um, and that just is, you know, an oversight of what this whole, why the leopard and how it contributes to landscape level conservation um, globally, as well as specifically here in Sri Lanka. And so to end with, I think we all know this, but I just wanted to highlight that conservation is an, a balancing, actually, like this leopard itself is doing right now. Uh, it's time dependent. Uh, tonight, uh, we can use acre ages of forest and it'll take us a long time to renew that forest, if at all. Um, it is multi-scale. I've been showing stuff at large scale, here, you know, landscape level scenarios that we need to consider. Um, and for us to consider solutions at that scale, there are multiple actors. It's not just one, two, three, just this government agency or this authority or this particular corporation or this particular landscape, uh, sorry, plantation authority, it's everybody and all of us there. So it's multiple actors that need to figure into this multi-scale solution if we are to look at using a species such as the leopard as a conservation proxy. So thank you for listening. Um, that's it from me. And I'd like to just, uh, you know, say that all of our ongoing work is under the collaboration and permission of the Department of Wildlife Conservation who works with us closely as well in many of these areas uh, and the Forest Department if required. And of course, to all our other partners who you know support us in a very variety of ways which none of this would be possible otherwise. Um, that's it. I think I can take any questions if there are. Thank you, Anjali. Yes, there are some questions that have been posted on the, in the chat box, um, let me see. Is the leopard population in Sri Lanka increasing or decreasing? That's the first question. Okay. Um, always the question that comes forward about numbers. So we did uh, a population estimate in 2008, and then we did one again 10 years later, 11 years later. Uh, obviously, in 2008, because the civil war was still ongoing, uh, we were not able to do a lot up in the war areas, whereas 10 years later, we were able to do. Um, and what we did find is we did not find a huge difference, which means that we didn't find a sig scientifically significant decrease. Um, and so that is what led IUCN International to uh, downgrade uh, the Sri Lankan subspecies of leopard from endangered to vulnerable. However, with the caveat that there has been a lot of uh, forest habitat depletion and landscape fragmentation, and that that does take a lag period to show up in impacting a specific species, especially a species like the leopard that is wide ranging. So it was requested that we do a, a quicker assessment 
rather than 10 years, which is the usual. And so it's currently being reassessed as a species globally, as well as then the subspecies. Uh, to see how that kind of change in landscape is impacting a species. Um, so the short answer is that we did not see a decrease or an increase, really, uh, but more of a status quo. Thank you. The next question from Priyanta Vijay Singh. Uh, I will read what he has written. I assume identification of individuals in the absence of radio callers is with only camera monitor and with only camera monitoring is by recognizable distinct patterns slash visible features. Yes, yes. So I mean this is standard uh, individual identification of a marked species. Uh, it's a standard methodology of capture recapture where you can, uh, uh, I mean, for example, in a leopard, we use the flank usually. Uh, you take three different locations and you that's what you use as a marker. So it's, as I've said many times, it's like a human fingerprint. It's individual to each particular individual of each particular leopard. So one indiv individual will only have that spot pattern. So you can, you know, identify it from images uh, if you have both sides, especially. So that's that's a standard standard way of identifying uh, individual animals. Right. The next one is: Do you plan to create a corridor between Yala and Nimalava? Good question. Wouldn't that be lovely? <laughs> The problem is, as many of you will know, and you saw in that map, it that it is extremely, extremely cut up already. Uh, it's got a lot of chena. It's got, uh, you know, a whole bunch of other things, right? Lots of hotels now, small places, um, organic agriculture, organic agriculture, and all of this going on. Ideally, that would be great to look at. Um, at least within the hotel zone, we brought up the conversation about trying to make that remain secure and lessen the footprint on, on it. Of course, it's multiple actors there again. Uh, so that would be ideal, but also to realize from what we showed and what we continue to see is that leopards and other wildlife are utilizing these areas. They are navigating through that. So it's important to realize that these mixed areas are also still um, valuable that, you know, that the, the animals themselves are using. So even if we can't, you know, have an ideal forest corridor, if we can look at how it can be, you know, somehow afforded some form of additional protection in between, that would be great. Uh, but putting in, you know, an actual corridor between the two uh, would be difficult because of all of these different factors, but definitely something to look into. And I'm glad you asked the question because yes, that's where our data is hoping to lead us to. Yes, another question from Priyanta Vijay Singh. Huh? I will read his uh, post. Is location of suitable areas by animals leaving a site due to crowding or competition, etc., totally random, therefore much more risky than if there was a sense of the direction of a suitable site to relocate? Um, okay, I'm not 100% sure what you're asking there. I take it that you're asking uh, naturally an animal dispersing. I'm assuming that's what you're asking. Uh, and that it disperses due to intra-species intra competition, like uh, we showed, you know, maybe happening in Vilpatu. Uh, and whether... Okay, so obviously the, the better area outside of the you know core area that you have uh, for dispersal uh, it is much better that 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 exists then a species will have less less of a risky area to move through hence the talk of buffers and patch forests and connecting corridors and so on um, they themselves will obviously choose that so actually what we are finding that is that by monitoring and understanding how leopards are using the landscape themselves, uh, they themselves are choosing the best route for dispersal. 
Um, and then if we can identify that and put that into some form of protection, then yes, of course, it's it's less risky for them if we can keep that protected. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, now Asoka Sriwantana asks, what countermeasures have been taken to protect leopards from getting caught in traps and snares, especially in the hill country? Okay. Um, yeah, good question. I mean, I didn't touch on that here other than for when I mentioned about why we started work up there. Um, so I, I want to be positive here because I think it's a positive thing. Uh, unlike, unfortunately, with our leopard-human conflict, I think with leopards that everyone who's uh, um, a stakeholder or a partner in this whole scenario, we're all on the same footing, as it were, in giving that same message about the fact that snares are what really needs to be addressed in uh, not just the hill country. The hill country is what we obviously know about mostly. Uh, we know it happens in the dry zone as well. We just don't know that as much because it's easier for a leopard to go and die quietly somewhere than in the middle of a tea plantation. Um, but definitely up in the hill country, there's a lot of push now uh, by all actors uh, to ensure that the understanding of a snare being laid and what that means uh, and how and why what's occurring that, you know, if they are targeting wild boar, for example, or deer, a leopard is also going to get caught in there. It's indiscriminate, you know. It cannot say, oh, I only want to target this particular species. So getting that message out there is uh, being extremely helpful because often people don't really want to target the leopard. Uh, the leopard is bycatch, as it were. And so when you kind of explain this, explain that uh, a leopard is moving through usually, it's not going to sit and, you know, live in the middle of a tea plantation. It has no need or use to be there. It's just moving through. So it's a lot of awareness that needs to go in. Uh, it's a lot of reducing the fear factor. And it's a lot of also on the other side, ensuring that people know that it's illegal to lay snares and that, you know, there's a jail term and a fine that goes with it. So the soft arm and the hard arm working together. Uh, which is is happening uh, with all of us actors who are working. Yeah, um, <clears throat> Chandra, Jarat, uh, Chandra. Uh, yes, um, if you uh, send an email to the society to secretary, I'm sure we can see about sending you a copy of the recording. But the recording will be available on the society's uh, uh, YouTube channel. Um, how many camera traps do you use per area? Did you rotate the camera traps within the place? That's another question. Yeah. So, you know, your grid of camera traps depends on the effective size that you're studying. Uh, there's, again, standard methodology of how you uh, use your remote cameras. Uh, so it all depends on the size and your coverage. Uh, we do move our grid around, especially if it's a you know, big area, 500 square kilometers, uh, would require a whole hell of a lot of cameras, which you know we can't afford to have at one go. So, uh, for example, we would have, uh, I mean, in Vilpatu or in Peak Ridge, where our first study, we had 75 locations, for example. And then you do, you know, you do a closed population study, which is about three months, um, and you move it around to try to understand and try to cover the whole area so you ensure that you are not having any holes in your study and you ensure that you're trying to capture as many of the resident animals as possible. Uh, there's a question, is tourism affecting ad adverse, adversely? Okay. Is tourism affected adversely? Okay. So again, you know, I always say that's a double-edged sword, right? One of those things about killing the goose that laid the golden egg uh, is one side. Are we watching the leopard to death? That's a whole other talk. <laughs> um, on the other side is that um, tourism that does put eyes on the ground. Uh, if not, we may have more poaching occurring, for example. Uh, I think it's, it's a concept uh, that will work if we realize what uh, if that particular tourism option is coming to, you know, look at leopards or look at wildlife, then really that needs to be the priority. The priority needs to be the wildlife, 
the resource, as it were, if that's how you want to call it, right, for tourism, not the uh, the consumer, not the tourist coming in. It's it's actually what they're coming to see. Right? So that's just my quick answer on that. There's a comment from Chandima. Great talk. Temporal portioning is interesting concept, especially when it comes to understand the risk-taking behavior of species like leopards. In Vaskamua, my research reveals leopards in Vaskamua Park active mostly at night, but outside the park, they are a little more active during the daytime. Any comments? Well, well, I mean, that's interesting. That's very interesting if, if you know, that's the case. And both uh, nighttime and daytime have been equally monitored both in and outside. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's what is being seen. Um, not, not perhaps as ex expected, but maybe there could be other uh, scenarios that are impacting that, Chandima. Something to discuss, I think, maybe at a, at a different uh, platform. Peter Razel asks, what is the role of a proxy species? Okay. Um, so when you mean a proxy species, it basically means where you're using one particular species, for example, here the leopard, as I said, as a proxy for conservation. So you're utilizing one particular thing to then inform something else. Um, so it, it's it's basically uh, using how the leopard utilizes it, how we are getting answers and solutions from that for a larger solution. Narita Rathbot, the junior says, sounds like corridors by nature are likely to be intruded upon or disrupted by humans, also poaching, trapping, any observations of such and remedies for that? Okay, so two questions kind of thing. Are corridors likely to be intruded upon? Um, I mean, humans are already there on that landscape. So the idea here is obviously not that corridors are, uh, you know, we're prioritizing or promoting that in, in lieu of having much more intact landscapes, no. It's basically to allow for an additional layer uh, of dispersal between two intact areas, for example. But what we're also finding is that these so-called corridors, I mean, corridors is just a term, you know, humans are using in a sense because it kind of looks like that, right? But the leopards themselves are using this, not just as dispersal corridors, but actually as refugia themselves. So they themselves are choosing these areas where often human um, utilization is a little bit less. Um, is there poaching and trapping in these areas? Yes, of course. I mean, we did a whole study in the in our highland area to understand uh, where leopards were actually being killed. And the interesting thing we found is that leopards, the deaths of leopards that occurred there are in forested areas. So humans are actually transcending and going into those areas. Snares are transcending time in that sense and space. Um, and going into those areas and so leopards are dying there. So that's definitely why we have this focus on trying to reduce the laying of uh, snares and traps in those areas. Uh, poaching, I mean, you know, poachers, whoever poach are going to poach anyway. We can only try to reach the next generation on one side, like I said, in the, on the soft arm and in the hard arm, uh, you know, wildlife department, other authorities need to come in on those who are poaching and be uh, strict on that side. Um, so that's kind of the balance. I hope that well, the, answers that. The final question from Harsh Ruan with a bit of a hot potato. Do you have a suggestion for DWC? <laughs> Well, I don't know, suggestion in what sense. I think some DWC rangers are online here. Yeah, I know that. Uh, um, suggestion in what sense? I mean, like I said, I think with the leopard, uh, it's a positive because all of us are working in the same camp. 
uh, it's very important that we all have the same message, that we all say the same thing and that the same solutions are being uh, put forward. And that is happening. So from that perspective, uh, uh, I mean, I think it's good that the DWC is doing that, working together with all of us different actors there. Uh, I mean, obviously there's, you know, many other suggestions, but uh, I'm not quite sure what specifically you mean by that, other than for what I've already said. Yeah, there are a couple of other questions that have come in, but we've come to 7.30 and I think we've had a very good evening. Um, and I think it's time we call this to an end. Um, the, uh, before I hand over to our president, Lester Pereira, uh, to say thank you, I would just like to say that next month's talk will be about aquatic, terrestrial and aquatic mollusks in wetlands by Mahesh Priyadarshana. Uh, Lester, could you take over and end the meeting, please? Yeah. Thank you, Anjali. It's pretty enlightening. I just had, just just uh, all the doctors said it's a final uh, question. I just want to, uh, uh, to uh, just want to ask you one question as to what kind of impact does uh, the leopard have when it comes to inbreeding, you know, mammalian inbreeding is a pretty dicey uh, subject uh, and pretty deep. But uh, with this melanism uh, aspect happening and uh, limited gene flow, uh, what kind of impact would that have? Uh, having said that, I, I like to like to thank you so much. You know, I, I known you guys. You've been working very hard throughout the years. I met you a couple of times, and then I meet uh, Andrew every now and then. Uh, Having said that, fantastic talk, pretty enlightening. Thank you, uh, thank you so much for you know the, the taking up this invite and talking to us and enlightening because this is this is our re the greatest resource we have in our country apart from the blue whales. So thank you so much, Anjali, for taking all the time. I know you've got a hectic lifestyle uh, with little ones. Uh, so thank you so much for taking your time to address this. Uh, our, the, one of the oldest uh, societies in the country, uh, the Natural History Society. Thank you so much, Anjali. If you can address the Thank you, uh, Lester. Question, yeah, thanks a lot. Um, so just very quickly, uh, you asked about inbreeding, right? Yeah. So that's the thing about having dispersal corridors. I mean, the whole this whole talk really was focusing on all of these things, but the reason why you, we talked about, you know, corridors between two forested areas, uh, you know, patches, uh, stepping stones for people, or buffers and all of this, is to enable a more secure dispersal ability for these species um, so exactly. that they can actually move out and breed and not get uh, restricted into one particular area and have then therefore uh, interbreeding occur as a result. Uh, we mentioned, um, you know, in World Cup to having injuries, we also had, you know, a few other things like, you know, there's some specific markers of inbreeding, uh, nothing huge, but still possibilities that we need to keep a close eye on. Um, and so that's why I think enabling this sort of movement across the landscape will prevent that inbreeding from occurring would ensure that it is one leopard population across the island and not subpopulations. Exactly. What, what, what's worrisome is that these small pockets are, 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 are an isolation of the small smaller mammals, which is a, a major issue when it comes to the shoes and mice and things like that. When when they can, they yeah. inbreed, uh, uh, then there, there's a whole gamut of uh, uh, issues which happen. So that was, of course, I mean, yeah. Yeah, so I mean, that's one of the things with, you know, obviously using a, a large mammal as a proxy. It's only just one solution. It's not the be all and end all. Uh, there are much smaller ranging, you know, site specific, um, you know, other biodiversity, you know, insects, uh, herbs and all of that, like you said, even small mammals. Um, and so obviously that needs to be looked at at a different tier and a different level. So this is not just the be-all answer, but it is a answer 
for this kind of landscape level, um, you know, quick, quick solution that we could look at in one way uh, to ensure that we try to keep some kind of connectivity intact. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much, Anjali. It's great, great, great work. Monument, monumental that. work that you've been doing for years. <laughs> Thanks for keeping uh, keeping up in spite of all the, 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 the hiccups every now and then. Okay. So take care and have fun. The full team effort. So yeah, thanks a lot. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you, Anjali. Uh, right. Vasanta, please send your change of email to me and to the secretary by email. I can't take it down now, okay? Uh, thank you, Harshada, for hosting this meeting. Today we were able to start on time and end of end in time, and we didn't have any of the technical hiccups that we had previously. Uh, see you all next month, everyone. Good night. Thank yeah. you, Vandali, once more. Bye. Thank Good you. Night. Good night. Bye. Thank you.